Good morning, High Street, and welcome to High Street United Methodist Church's Sunday School Small Group. And as we continue the journey through Exodus, today we're in Exodus chapter 4. And let me tell you, there's a part of this passage that you have probably never realized was in the Bible before. And, I, and we'll look at it and we'll both go, I have no clue, but it's an exciting time. So let's get into the text and let's pray together. Lord, today, as we again go with Moses through the wilderness and as, as he's still encountering you at the burning bush and he's still there, Lord, speak to us as well. Speak to us of your love. Speak to us of your passion. Speak to us of what's going on in this text and help us understand why it was so important for you that Israel, the Hebrew people, would be able to be brought to freedom from Egypt all through Christ. Amen. So we're beginning in uh, chapter 4, and chapter 4 is a continuation of chapter 3. Chapter 3 is where Moses is wandering around with the sheep, and he sees a bush on fire, and it's burning, but it's not being consumed. And so he goes and he checks it out. And today we're, we're encountering and he's still count, talking to the God of Abraham, the God of Joseph, the God of his ancestors, the God of Isaac. He's still talking to God and sharing and understanding Yahweh, uh, I am who I am. And God says to, to Moses, I want you to go and, and to let, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Then Moses has some problems. Moses has some excuses. Moses has some questions still. His first question, of course, was back in chapter 3, who am I supposed to say you are? But then, after he gets that answered, then Moses replies, but, but what if they don't believe me? What if they don't pay attention to me? They might say, the Lord didn't really appear to you. Who does God have to convince to make us move? Who does God have to convince for us to do the ministry that God is calling us to do? Typically, it's us. And in this case, God has to convince Moses. Moses, who in his early years appeared strong-willed and desiring justice, willing to commit murder to make sure his people saw freedom and, and were not oppressed. You know, willing to, to run off bandits, to, to protect women as they came to give water to their, their flock. But now Moses is much different. Moses has questions. Moses is more meek. Moses is scared. The Lord said to him, what, what is that in your hand? And Moses replied, it's a shepherd's rod. It's a staff. The Lord said, throw it down on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back from the snake. But then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand, grab the snake by the tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it and it turned back into a rod in his hand. Do it this way so that they will believe that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has in fact appeared to you. In other words, God says, you want proof? You want evidence? Here you go. Throw that stick on the ground. It'll become a snake and then pick it back up and it'll become a stick again. Proof one. Proof two. Again, the Lord said to Moses, put your hand inside your coat. So Moses put his hand inside his coat. When he took his hand out, his hand had a skin disease, leprosy. It was flaky like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your coat. So Moses put his hand back in his coat. When he took it back out again, the skin had the hand had returned to normal. If they don't believe you or pay attention to you to the first sign, they may believe you with the second sign. Proof two. Moses gets leprosy by putting his hand in his coat and then puts his hand in his coat again and the hand comes out normal. These are really cool magic tricks is, is what it really sounds like. The third one is just as awesome. If they don't believe even these two signs or pay attention to you, then take some water from the Nile River and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the Nile will turn into blood on the dry ground. Now, what's really important here about this third magic trick or miracle is, is that Moses is taking water from the very source of life for Egypt. 
The Nile River is everything to Egypt. In fact, today in, in, in modern times, um, the Ethiopian government is considering putting a dam on the Nile River, which will affect downriver Egypt. And there's going to be some potential problems there. But do you hear what I'm saying is that the water was life. You're in the middle of the desert. This is the water. This is the irrigation for your crops. This is the water for your food, the water for yourself, for your flocks. This Nile is life, and the life blood of Egypt turns literally into blood. Can you imagine? Now, all three of these are really magical tricks, really cool things that God does with Moses. But who is he trying to convince here, really? Moses asks, you know, well, what if they don't pay attention to me? But the reality is, is that who God is really trying to convince here is Moses. Moses is the one who's afraid. Moses is the one who's terrified. But Moses again says to God, again with the excuses, My Lord, I've never been able to speak well, not yesterday, not the day before, and certainly not now since you've been talking to your servant. I am slow in my mouth and thick in my tongue. He stutters and slobbers and can't quite get the words out. Then the Lord said to him, who gives people the ability to speak? Just, just who do you think you are? Who gives the ability to people to speak? Who's responsible for making them unable to speak or hard of hearing, sighted or blind? Isn't it I, the Lord? So go, I'll help you speak. I'll teach you what you should say. Go. And finally, finally we get down to the conundrum. But Moses said, please, my Lord, just send somebody else. Just send somebody else. Don't send me. I, I, let me write a check. I'll, I'll send money. L let me say some prayers. I'll, I'll pray for them. But I don't want to lead. I don't want to go about doing this. Oh, send somebody else. Just don't send me. Again, who, who is it that God has to convince? Who does God have to convince for us to do God's ministry? for us to be God's people, for us to rise up and say, things should change. This is not the kingdom of God. This is not the way things are. Who does God have to convince for us to get involved, for us to lead? It's us. And in this case, it's Moses. Continuing the text, then the Lord got angry with Moses and said, all right, what about your brother, Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak very well. He's on his way out to meet you now, and he's looking forward to seeing you. Speak to him and tell him what he's supposed to say. I'll help both of you speak. I'll teach both of you what to do. Aaron will speak for you the, to the people. He'll be the spokesperson for you, and you can be like God for him and guide him. Take this shepherd's rod with you too so that you can do the signs. I think in this particular passage, God actually gets to understanding more and more about who Moses is afraid of. Moses is afraid of God, but Moses is even more afraid of God's people, of the Israelites. And there's some good reasons for this. Remember, Moses was raised in Pharaoh's daughter's household. He wasn't raised among the Hebrews. He doesn't understand their cultures, their customs, who they are, their language possibly, even is foreign to his ears. Moses is afraid of the people, afraid that maybe they'll see him the same way those other two Hebrews had back in chapter 2. When Moses committed the murder of the Egyptian, he, he, found, he thought of himself as a hero, but later on when he tries to get the Hebrews to stop squabbling with each other, they, they, they are, they'd say, oh, are you going to kill me too? They don't see him as liberator, they see him as just a murderer. And perhaps Moses is afraid of that. Moses is a fearful character. His, his, his whole being has changed. He's gotten older, and he's, he's lived in a different world as a stranger. And here he is terrified of God. He's terrified of the people. If we continue on, he's terrified of his wife, possibly. He's definitely terrified of his father-in-law. He's scared. Moses went back to his father-in-law, Jethro, the text says, and said to him, Please let me go back to my family in Egypt to see whether or not they are still living. He doesn't even tell Jethro the truth. 
He's not going back to find out whether they're living or not. He's going back because God's given him a mission. But Moses is afraid. Moses is scared. I mean, wouldn't you be? If you had had a conversation with God and suddenly God told you to, to go back and, and undo what you had done, to go back and stand up and, and be this leader suddenly for a group of people who don't even know you, wouldn't you be terrified? Wouldn't you be scared? It's kind of like a pastor being sent to a congregation he's never met somewhere in Virginia, only to find out that he's got to lead them and cast the vision. That happens a lot with United Methodists. But you hear what I'm saying. Moses is afraid. Moses is fearful. He's weak. He's scared. He's scared of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, who was his grandfather or brother or father, he had this image, depending on whether you believe Disney's version or not. Pharaoh was, the, was seen in Egypt as the direct descendant of God. You know, it was God and then the Pharaoh and then everybody else. And so Moses is having to talk back to who he grew up thinking was the spokesperson for God, only to find that now he is the spokesperson for God. That God chose him from a burning bush in the middle of nowhere by a mountain to speak, to speak for God. Moses is weak, scared, afraid of Pharaoh, afraid of the people, afraid of his father-in-law, afraid of speaking, using every excuse, just send somebody else. But God doesn't stop poking. God doesn't stop asking. The voice of God doesn't end when Moses leaves the mountain. Moses leaves the mountain and goes back to Midian to talk to his father-in-law. And perhaps he's, he's, he's going along with God's vision, but he thinks maybe that God only speaks at the mountain. God only speaks in this one geographic area. But the next scripture shows us that that's not true. The Lord said to Moses in Midian, no longer at Mount Horeb, but in Midian, the Lord says to Moses at Midian, go back to Egypt because everyone who wanted to kill you has died. In other words, God's voice doesn't stop. God's voice stays with Moses now. Wherever Moses is, God is still going with him and speaking with him. This is a really important thing because in the era that, that, that this story is taking place in the time frame, in fact, even after this time frame, biblically speaking, a lot of times the people of the Bibles, the people of the biblical era, the people who these stories are about, really believe that God was only God of a certain geographic area. And in fact, even today, um, you, you, you hear kind of these concepts that, that, that the, God, uh, 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 the God that we have is the God of Europe and America, but, but there's another God for China or there's another God for the Middle East. And that was kind of the concept then, is that gods and deities were only in specific geographic areas. So Moses must have assumed for a long time that oh, God only spoke at Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai is the other name for Mount Horeb, and, 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 and that, that would be where he'd always have to go to hear God speak. But no, here God even speaks in whispers, reminding him, don't forget your mission. The people, are, the people who you were scared of are dead now. Don't forget your mission. Go. So Moses, the text says, took his wife and his children and put them in a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. Moses also carried the shepherd's rod from God in his hand. Moses eventually goes, and with him he brings Zipporah, his wife, and the kids. It's a family trip, which could cause problems. So think about this. Zipporah has lived with her father her entire life, and suddenly a stranger comes and her father offers her to the stranger to marry. And for a long time, they're happy. They're, they're having kids and, and, and her husband's going off doing the shepherd detail, you know, taking care of the sheep. And now he comes home one day with the sheep and says, hey, uh, pack up. I've asked your dad for permission. Um, we're going to go meet my family. You know, how much stress must have that added to Zipporah's life, to the kids' lives? The Lord said to Moses again, When you go back to Egypt, make sure that you appear before Pharaoh and do all the amazing acts that I've given you the power to do. But I'll make him stubborn, so he won't let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my oldest son. 
I said to you, let my son go so that he could worship me, but you refused to let him go. As a result, I am now going to kill your oldest son. In this little passage that's kind of inserted inside of chapter 4, we really get the key to understanding a lot of what's been happening in Exodus and Genesis, you know, with, with Abraham and Isaac up on the mountain. Uh, you know, Abraham offering his son to God, his firstborn, is tied to this. It, it's tied to this notion that the firstborn of God is Israel. And God is expecting Israel to be blessed and not to be oppressed. It's about the freedom that that is offered to the oppressed. It's about the fact that God is accusing Pharaoh of stealing God's firstborn from him. It's about the fact that in this particular passage, God is going to practice in God's own sight what he later on tells Moses to be a law. And that is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, vengeance for vengeance. God accuses Pharaoh of stealing his oldest son. And so now God is going to kill Pharaoh's oldest son. It's a weird, hard text for us who like to see God as more compassionate and and, and more merciful. But keep in mind also that this is the people who went through this experience. This is Moses and the people of Israel writing about how they believed God worked in the midst of their lives. This is their their theological history. And so they're viewing it and they're casting it in, in the sight that they see themselves as the children of God. They see themselves as the firstborn of God. And they see themselves as as marked to be different by God, marked by this method of circumcision that protects them, a mark that causes bleeding. Uh, You know, circumcision is cutting the foreskin off of the male penis. I know you didn't expect to hear that this morning in Sunday school, but I'm preparing you for the next part of chapter 4. This is the part that I said at the beginning of this lesson. You probably never realized unless you read through the Bible entirely that, that was in here. And even if you did read through the Bible in its entirety, you probably really skipped, glanced through this as fast as you could because it's such a weird, awkward, weird, strange text. So here's what the text says. During their journey, Moses, Zipporah, and the children. As they camped overnight, the Lord met Moses and tried to kill him. But Zipporah took a sharp-edged flint stone and cut off her son's foreskin. Then she touched Moses' genitals, or feet, depending on the translation you're reading, with it. And she said, you are my bridegroom because of the bloodshed. So the Lord let him alone. And at that time, she announced a bridegroom because of bloodshed by circumcision. So what is going on here? This is a really weird text. Well, here's some observation that might help out, is that there are other places in the Bible where gods or deities or the Lord, depending on how the translation is written, wrestles or or gets angry, or kills, you know, or attempts to do something, and this is one of those. And one of the other places is in the book of Genesis. Um, you might remember Jacob, uh, before he crosses the river, river wrestles with God, or, or the translation sometimes says, wrestles with an angel. The, the Hebrew kind of indicates a river god, uh, a deity of that river of sorts. And, and this is an, another instance of those kind of stories where it really doesn't give us a lot to work with. We, we, we don't really know what's going on in this scripture. But I want to take a, li- a glance and I want to try to go, let's go to the origin of possibilities. Let's look inside the story for maybe some reasonings that might be going on. Remember, I said Zipporah had just left her father's place with her children, a place that they had known as home for their entire lives to follow their crazy husband father, to go off and meet his family in the middle of nowhere, heading to Egypt where they know that he was a murderer possibly and accused of all kinds of things and might be thrown in jail. Oh, no, you never know. So there's a lot of internal fight that might be happening between Zipporah and Moses. Can you imagine the conversation when he came home that day? Um, honey, uh, God spoke with me, 
And um, I tell you what, we're, we're going back to, we're going to go see my family, and, and I'm, I'm going to bring them out of slavery, and um, I want to take you and the kids with me, okay? It's going to be fun. Can you imagine the, the fight about leaving? Can you imagine the fight about circumcision? Moses and Zipporah have a conversation. You know, all our boys, all our children, you know, I know they're, they're getting young and they're growing. Oh, man, they're so tall. We need to circumcise them. Oh, oh what, what, what circumcision? Oh, it's nothing. It's just a little piece of skin we cut off of their penis. Yeah, I can't imagine that conversation going really well with, 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 with Zipporah. I just can't imagine it going well. And, and not to mention that, but suddenly maybe Moses, for the first time in his life, is having a conversation with his wife and his family about faith. You know, one of the hardest conversations, one of the most important conversations that we have as families, as parents, moms and dads, is we have to talk about faith. We have to talk about what we believe with our children. Because if we don't, we're leaving them as impressible pieces of Play-Doh to go out into the world and to receive whatever somebody else believes. We have to tell our kids what we believe. You know, we just had an election. We have to tell our kids why we vote the way we vote, not just to, not to, to, to tell them who to vote for later on in life. I don't think that's the right thing, but to give the impression of our thought process, to give the impression of how our beliefs, how our core faith elements actually affect who we are and impact the world around us. Moses and Zipporah had to have those kind of conversations, possibly for the first time. And so maybe it's not necessarily the Lord who meets Moses, and tries to kill him in the middle of nowhere, maybe Zipporah and him were having a big honking fight. Our understanding is clouded, and there's not much to go here. Some scholars, I will say this, connect this with Pharaoh and the firstborn. So maybe God was coming and trying to kill Moses' firstborn as an example to Moses, as another sign uh, pressing him on. And Moses got in the way and was wrestling with God to prevent God from killing Moses' firstborn. And then, you know, the bloodshed of the circumcision satisfied God's anger or wrath would be an understanding of that one. The killing of firstborn, though, seems to be important as a part of the meta narrative, the, the overarching story through Genesis and Exodus. And we're left kind of wondering what the heck was this all about? But it's a story about the experience of Moses, God, and Zipporah. And it's one that we can kind of pull as much as we can out of. But we're always going to be left with this, what was that all about? Chapter 4 ends, though, with some more clarity. Because chapter 4 ends with the reunion. While Moses and his family had begun traveling back towards that Mount, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, on the other side in Egypt... God has also been speaking to Levi, the Lord, I mean, to the Levite named Aaron. The Lord said to Aaron, go to the desert and meet Moses. So he went and Aaron met, God, met him at God's mountain and greeted him with a kiss. Moses told Aaron what the Lord had said about his mission and all the signs of the Lord that God had told him to do. And Moses and Aaron called together the Israelite elders. A big, huge family reunion takes place. Aaron tells them everything that the Lord had told Moses, and he performed the signs in front of the people. You remember the snaky stick, the withered hand, and the blood from the Nile River. When they heard what the Lord had paid attention to the Israelites and had seen their oppression, they bowed down and worshipped. It's a nice conclusion to the chapter 4. It's, it's everybody's together again. But it leads us to some questions that the text doesn't give answers to either. Um, I, I'm left questioning, how did Aaron survive? He's a male. He's a brother of Moses. Did the, the, the genocide end? Are, are males allowed to live now? That, that Moses, that, that, did the act of Moses being put in the water and going home with Pharaoh's daughter completely unravel the system? Did this, this, this holy act of civil disobedience change the way Pharaoh did things? Maybe this is a story that, 
that maybe Moses saved, that maybe the act of Moses' mother saving Moses saved Le- this Levite family as well in Aaron, Moses' brother. You know, and, and there's some other questions about this, is that you know, how easily did Moses have it coming back? He couldn't have been acquainted with the customs and rituals. He probably didn't even know who the elders were. And so one of the great things about Aaron being a part of this is that Aaron becomes the inside man for Moses and his conversations with Israel. Of course, the miracles, the signs, the magical stuff probably overwhelmingly convinced them. We would think that. But in their day, that kind of stuff was somewhat normal. It was expected of leaders or prophets or those who spoke on behalf of Pharaoh or on behalf of the gods or on behalf of Yahweh, the God, to do something. This is is a part of the Egyptian culture. And I would say that the book of Exodus is playing into that, that God had to accommodate, as God often does, our own human limitations, our own human understandings. In the end, though, the Israelites believe They bow down. They worship. They worship not Moses, not Aaron, but they worship God. And they are praising God, for God has heard their oppression. God has heard their cries, and now they feel like there is going to be some change. I hope you'll kind of stay with me as we go forward into the change, into next week, and continuing the book of Exodus. I hope you struggle, just like I do with chapter 4, and some of the weird places in this verse, uh, in this chapter. But I also hope you hear the overwhelming part, which is this. Who does God have to convince for us to do God's ministry? Go look in the mirror. That's where the answer is. God has to convince us. And it really shouldn't have, it shouldn't take magic withered hands and snaky sticks and water turning into blood. What it really does take, though, is faith, our faith, our faith and trust in God and our willingness to serve, to give God what is already God's. Let us go do that. Let us do ministry with God, however and whatever ways we can, to show and shine love today. Thanks for tuning in. May God bless you and keep you and lead you throughout this week. Amen.